Why you be all on my line about nothing? Why won't you go get you a dollar or something? Dollar or something? Get you a dollar or something? Recording live in the Conscious Creative Media Studios from somewhere in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, you are listening to the world's greatest photography podcast with your host, Bill Howard. Thank you once again, Scott, and you are listening to the world's greatest photography podcast, and we can be found on basically all the podcasting sites, as well as on YouTube at Conscious Creative Media. That's C-R-E-8-I-V-E. We're here today with former real estate agent and current real estate photographer and videographer, Brian Kurtz of MichiganVideoTours.com. And you can also find him on Instagram at It's Brian Kurtz. And Brian... When someone is trying to grow their real estate photography business, what do you think is the best way to approach agents? Are you looking for face-to-face -face meetings? Or are you looking for email marketing? How, how do you uh, uh, try to bring in new agents? So, you know, I've been in a lot of, again, in a lot of discussion forums. So lots of people say they've had success with all kinds of different things. Uh, I can only speak to what I've had success with. And uh, as a realtor, I did cold calling. And so I use the skills uh, in cold calling uh, to get my first set of agents. And I only cold called for like two weeks. And the first week, actually, if you, if you think of about... Uh, a period of time that I did it, the first week was all research. So I did a, a week of research and then a week worth of cold calling. And then I got, you know, my first set of customers and I guess I should have probably continued to do that process. But like all, all of us, right, the biggest problem in marketing is people stop doing it. Um, and so my business basically grew from that initial group. I got a, a set of like seven agents up front in the beginning. And then I have the majority of them, I think, except for one today. One of them didn't end up using me long term. Another one I lost to a competitor. And the rest of them still use me today. And the vast majority of all of my customers came from referrals from those agents or they saw my videos on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere. So um, that is, you know, I used cold calling and my approach was this, here was my thought on this whole thing, right? Because, and I'm, I'm fine, I feel like, you know, let's kill a sacred cow here because there's this idea floating around out there that I thought was absolutely crazy. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. It's like one of those ideas that looks good from afar, but then you look at it closer and you're like, oh, this is far from good. And th this idea that's floating out there that I believe is a myth is this. Go after the agents who are already using professional photography on their listings. That's like this kind of like this main mantra. And the idea behind that that they use the logic flow is these people already appreciate professional photography. You don't know of all the all the agents out there who are still using their cell phone. You don't know if they, you know, they they're they're proving that they don't appreciate professional photography. So you're going to be beating your head against a brick wall. And I think that that's completely backwards, um, where you know struggle and difficulty is concerned, because then you follow those 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 topic threads, and basically the the idea is, you know, somebody's going to bring this counterpoint up. Well those agents are already connected at the hip with another photographer. So why are they going to use you? And then people throw things on there. Well, your quality and maybe this or that. And you're, you got to find out what makes you different and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, you certainly can't compete on quality because you're brand new. The other guy's been shooting for five years. Are you going to be this magic person because you took a class online? You haven't shot 500 homes. You don't know how to defeat all of the, the different little obstacles you're going to come in contact when you're in different shooting situations, different lighting situations. You know, those are real things that you will experience once you start doing them. Timing, what do you do when you've got storms coming in? What do you got when you got bad lighting coming in? It's, you know, it's too sunny, not sunny enough, all kinds of things like this, right? You can't say that you're going to kill your competition on quality when you're brand new. That's silly. So, you know, you're trying to pry somebody with an existing relationship 
away from the agent. The agent is going to want to remain loyal to their current agent or their current photographer, most likely, unless they're using a really high volume, one of the high volume national companies where they're just, you know, sif, you know, crunching photographers through there every three months and they quit and they send them a PDF and like, here's how you do it. You know, if you have a situation like that where there's no personal relationship, maybe you could um, get in there, but how would you know which ones have a great personal relationship and which ones are which ones don't. And so I was thinking, now that's gonna be very hard to crowbar away, um, you know, as a new photographer, how are you gonna crowbar away customers from existing photographers who have more experience from you? That sounds like a really uphill battle. And so I took it from a completely diff different perspective. Here was my idea. Being an agent, here's what I know about agents. Um, I mean, we can talk a whole bunch about agents and who they are and what they're dealing with, you know, know your customer and all that. But one point about them is this, uh, agents are all, if you think of them as a group, they're all going through a process in their life, right? Some agents are the two year, you know, vast majority of them, they start, they don't last uh, more than three years, they don't renew their license, so they die on the vine. Some of them last a long time and they never really do much business. This is kind of like the side gig and they're happy doing six deals a year, which is the average number of closed transactions that the realtor in America does. They do about six transactions a year. They, they make about $40,000 a year after you account for their expenses, uh, which is not a lot of money. And they're, they're fine with that because the spouse is the, you know, the main income maker. So all their money's gravy and they don't, and they don't care, right? And then you have the third group of people that are going, they're going to start as a newbie and they're going to be really quite a top performer, but they're not a top performer in the beginning. They are going through their own process. They're going through their own journey to becoming a top performer. They're doing the things necessary, the hard work necessary to get them from zero to hero. And here's the deal. There are agents out there this year that are in that magic transition zone, okay? Assuming that you're in a market that doesn't have 100% satur satur uh, saturation, there are markets like that. A friend of mine, Jed Pearson, he's in Salt Lake. He says 90% of all of the houses have pro-grade photography. In, Michi in Metro Detroit, it's nowhere near that. It's like less than 20% have pro-grade photos. If you look at all of the cities in, Metro, in the four counties, um, and it's climbing, sure, but uh, one in four, and they tend to be concentrated well, you know, north of the three hundred thousand dollar mark. So all of the people that are, you know, under two fifty tend to be getting cell phone photos. They're they're treated like second class citizens, which is another topic for another day. But um, the the thing that you're dealing with here is these agents are at that point where the reason why they've been doing cell phone photos in the past is they didn't have enough money, but now they do. They really do have enough money at this point. They've worked their way in their career. They've been doing the right things. They can stroke the check, start from now till forever uh, on pro-grade photography. They just haven't made the leap yet, okay? And every year there's going to be a new group of agents. They started five years ago and now they're there, right? Next year there will be a new group of agents. The next year there will be a new group of agents, right? It's like a revolving door. There's always people coming in. A bunch of them die off and some of them are going to last. And the ones that last are going to reach that little cut cusp where they're ready to be like, I need a photographer. I'm, I'm not going to be able to be professional in the marketplace without pro-grade photos on every single listing. So the question then is this, how do you find those people? Because if you can find those people, well, now you don't, they're ready to go. They're ready to make the transition. They have the money and they're not attached to an agent already. Wouldn't that, I mean, if you were looking for agents, wouldn't that be the perfect kind of person you would want to prospect exactly. for? Right. So that's what I thought. So here's what you do. It's real simple. You know, I was a realtor. You know, I'm still a realtor. My license is holding as of just this year. But at that time, I was active. I was still selling houses when I first launched this whole thing. So I had the access to the MLS. I'm going to assume people listening to this don't have access to the MLS. And so here's how you do it if you 
don't have access to the MLS, what you're going to do is you're going to create a spreadsheet. You're going to fire up a spreadsheet and you're going to do your research phase, right? Remember how I said we researched for a week and then we called for exactly. a week and then I stopped forever, right? Yeah. So you are going to have research week, which means you're going to drink coffee and you're going to, you know, fart around on Netflix and not be as dedicated <laughs> to your work as you're supposed to be, right? Like I was not dedicated as I was supposed to be, right? Because you're just kind of half working. But you're going to do the project over the course of a week and get it all done. And the process project's really simple. You create a, um, uh, uh, a spreadsheet with two columns, right? The name, right? Uh, and uh, profile URL. And you are going to go into Zillow. And you're going to go in, look, start looking in the preferred cities that you would be wanting, be willing, basically be willing to drive through and start clicking on the individual listings. And then you will have the listing agent listed there. And you can click on their profile, can't you? Yeah, you can. So you click on their profile and on Zillow, it'll have like a history. It'll say like, you know, number of houses sold in the previous right. 12 months, number of listings sold and like that. You know, it divides them up on the listings they sold versus the ones where they had closings where they held the buyer. You only care about the listings. You don't care how many buyers they work with. You care about how many listings they've been selling. And you want to look for a number like 12 or more. You're looking for agents that have two things. They're in the last year, they've 12, sold 12 listings. And you look at all those 12 listings. And they pretty much maybe don't have pro-grade photos on them. That means they have not chosen a photographer as of yet. So finding those people can be, is the process, right? The clicking and the examining and then looking at all the previous listings, right? But when you find one of them, you grab the URL at the top of the window for their profile page and you copy it and you go into your, into your spreadsheet and you type their name in column one name and you paste the URL to their profile page in column two and hit save. And then you go find another one. And you find as many of these people as you can until you just can't do it anymore. 50 would be nice. Uh, I don't think I found 50. I think I found like 35 total. And you do that in week one. In week two, what you do is you call them, right? So you're gonna go open up your spreadsheet Click on the link in it. It'll fire up your window and there it'll pull you right there to their profile page. And guess what they put on their profile page? Their phone number, their cell phone number. Because they want to be them. reached, just not necessarily by you. Right. <laughs> right. So you call them and a most, a lot of them, amazingly enough, they're not going to answer. Right. And so here's a little hack. Right. If you have uh, Google contacts, Here's what I would do if I were you. This makes it a lot easier. Um, if you have Google Contacts or you have a Contacts or whatever, whatever contact, when you type it in on the computer, it syncs to your phone, right? I use Google Contacts. Mm -hmm. Before you call any of those people the first time, you put their name in there and their phone number in Google Contacts. The reason why is so many of them are not gonna answer, but when they call you back, they're just a phone number unless you save them in your contacts. If you save them in the contacts, their name shows up and you can say, hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Hi, right? Versus hello, you know, right. you don't know if they're a bill collector, you don't know if they're a, they're a what you call it, a robocaller or, a, or what. So um, you need to, if you can have their name pop up, that helps. So you save them before the first call. From there, what you do is you just start calling through the list. Never leave messages, right? If you contact them, you highlight them in the uh, in the, the spreadsheet. Uh, spreadsheet, right? So yellow means you called and they didn't answer. You never leave messages because they'll either call you back or you're just going to go through the whole spreadsheet again. If you spoke with them and qualified them, you highlight them and put them with one of two colors, red or green. Red means they're dead to you. You're not going to, you don't care about contacting them back. Green means they showed some interest, right. right? And so that's the calling process. You call through the whole list and either they be, they get left blank, right? They, um, they answer uh, and you highlight them as, you know, green for potential interest or red. And you just keep calling until you get them all changed colors uh, or you just quit because you got so much right. success. Uh, right, right. 
And so then the follow-up question, I'm guessing your follow-up question is going to be, what do you say to them when they answer the phone, right? Obviously. And here's what you say. Here's what you say, okay? Um, first of all, you have to plan for your offer, your pitch, your magic thing you're going to give them to get them to say to do business with you. So we're going to rewind this whole thing. And we're going to think about psychology and thinking and get our heads screwed on straight about business and marketing because that's what you're doing, right? You're prospecting. It's not technically marketing. It's prospecting. But there's cost to this, just like there'd be cost if you were mailing postcards to all agents. You'd be paying cash cost in that case. In this case, you're going to be, since you're prospecting, you are, should be willing to commit the cash value of your time to this. If you don't have a whole bunch of money to start spending on Facebook ads, and which I could never make work, or postcards, which I've never heard anybody make work, um, that doesn't mean you get to do this and everything's free. You should be going into this with the idea of, I'm trying to get customers and there is going to be a cost to me. And some of the people that I give my offer to are going, I'm going to sink the cost in there and they're not going to use me and it's going to be a loss. And I'm not going to care because every business has losses in marketing. They write checks and they don't get all the money back on every single person, Correct. right? So you go into it with that mentality. I am going to do things and it's going to cost me and it's going to hurt and I'm not going to get any money back for it on some of them. And I'm not going to care because I will get a whole bunch of money on many of on, on enough of them that it's all going to even out, right? And in fact, let's backtrack even one more set, step for the psychology. And this is probably the biggest business principle that anybody in any business needs to know. Um, I've heard three different super business coachy people say the same thing. And I don't think they got it from each other. They've all come to it uh, through their business pr process and it's absolutely true. The number one most important thing in business, the only thing that really, really matters is lifetime customer value. How much money does each customer represent to you over the lifetime? If they do business with you for the rest of your career, how much money do they represent? The amount of money you spend today will pale in comparison to the lifetime value of a customer. And so you should be easily willing to spend, you know, I have customers, let's put it in perspective, okay? I have customers that spend $5,000 a year with me um, every year. So if they, if I am in this business, I'm 40 now, let's just assume I wasn't gonna, you know, I was just gonna do this. I wasn't gonna shift into a different, into the architecture side or whatever. I'm just gonna do this forever. And they're gonna stay with me for 20 years. At $5,000 a year, that means in 10 years of business, um, they've been worth $50,000 to me. In 20 years of business, they represent $100,000 of revenue. How much money, and I'm just going to ask you real quick. If you knew a customer was going to be worth $100,000 over the course of, their, of your life, your lifetime value, how much money would you spend to get that customer bill? I mean, I think the depending on the industry, a 10% marketing amount is not outrageous. Okay, so 10% on 100,000 would be 10,000. So you'd be willing, in theory, to spend $10,000 to get one customer. And, you know, that all makes sense in theory, right? But I guarantee you there's no real estate photographers out there probably that are thinking about lists that are going to be planning on spending $10,000 to get one customer that's going to just give them 5,000 a year, right? But the good news is this, right? You really only have to be willing to invest about less than 250 bucks and not in cash, in your time. You are listening to the world's greatest photography podcast with your host, Bill Howard. We're here today with Brian Kurtz of michiganvideotours.com and he has got some great stuff going on right now. So. 
we're talking about the investment is not as great as what one would really think, and it's only in time. Correct. Your own time. Exactly. So, you know, the basis of my whole approach to this, my thinking was this, uh, free shoot, trade a free shoot in order to try to get a customer for life that's going to represent anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $100,000 in lifetime customer value. Uh, if you, you know, if you average, you know, right now, it's been this way for a while. The average shoot nationwide is about $200. Um, that means half the Half of all the checks being written from realtors to photographers are less than $200. Half of them are more. For everyone that's written at $150, there's one written at $250. For everyone that's written at $100, there's going to be one written at $300. That's what the average means, right? So um, if the average is $200, maybe your pricing is more. My average for just photos only on a four-bedroom bread-and-butter house is $250. And that's the retail cost. But let's just use the retail cost, right? Assuming it's $250 worth of my time to do a free shoot for an agent, that's what it really means to me. Am I going to trade $250 of my time for the potential to get anywhere from $25,000 to $100,000 customer? And I think everybody, if your business sense is screwed on right, the answer should be yes. If the answer is no, you need to probably take a step back and start really tumbling in your mind the business side of things. Because if you're not willing to rate, trade, not even 250 of cash, just 250 of your time. If you don't have any cash, that's fine. You just to trade 250 of your time for the potential, potential to get one of these customers. And again, go into it knowing you're going to trade $250 sometimes and they ain't going to use you. right? So you're going to lose that $250 and you're going to go into it with your mind right, where you're cool with it. You're like, okay, fine, fine. I'm fine with it because you know what? What if it's one out of four? One out of four does you, I, that's $1,000 worth of time for a $50,000 lifetime value customer. Do I trade $1,000 worth of my time for 50 grand? The answer should be yes. The answer should be yes. If it's $1,000 worth of my time for $25,000 customer lifetime value, not a, not a big producer agent, should you say yes? The answer is yes. So, here, here was my thinking, right? Free shoot. Now, here's here's like a little rabbit trail on this uh, because people go crazy, crazy photographers, man. I've never seen photographers. <laughs> you know, there is no industry. Let, let, let's talk about my my brother-in-law real quick. He owns a, a pizza shop, a gourmet pizza shop, right? Brick oven thing. And they, he lays them all out and the customers come in, they pick the slices, he puts them in the brick oven, reheats them and sell it. Man, he's doing great, right? He's in the rich part of town. I guarantee you, this dude at the end of every day is taking the leftover pizza and putting it in the trash. Is he freaking out because he has a little bit of loss? Is he freaking out? I made my pizzas, man. I shouldn't have any loss. No. But you have photographers, you tell them, hey, do a free shoot, right? Because you're going to be able to get yourself so busy. I'm not doing that. That's going to water down the industry. That's going to this. Like, and here's the other crazy thing, right? Water down the industry. Like, we got a big union. Like, everybody's looking out for each other. No, nobody's looking out for each other, okay? You can't bring union mentality to a free market system. There is no union. There's no way to police people. And so you've got people that think like, hey, we got, I got to do this thing and not do any free shoots because I got to protect the next guy. I don't want to bring the industry down, race to the bottom and all this crazy talk, right? That they're not even thinking about the thinking that's behind those words coming out of their mouths. You know, my, my brother-in-law, he has waste. You are a business owner. You should plan to have waste. And just like it's water out of the back of a duck, he's had hundreds of days where he shoved pizzas in the trash. He does not care. It doesn't bother him. It's part of the business. If you have waste and you have loss, you should be cool with it. Water off the back of a duck because it's part of your business and you don't care as long as every month of every year you see growth versus the same month the previous year. If your January this year is this is more profitable, 10%, 20% more than the January last year, 
you're fine. If June of next year is 10, 20% pro more profitable than June of this year, you're fine. You shouldn't be worrying about the little losses. And, and that now, what you're saying, there's a lot of animosity between the photographers on the whole free thing or undervaluing what your work is. And in fact, I on one of in fact one of the groups that you and I are both in, yeah. I commented not long ago that number one, there's two ways to make a profit. Right. Increase the income yeah. or decrease expenses. You figure out which way. Now, if I'm spending right. my time, my expense is only my time. Right. I can go to bed an hour later. Exactly. Exactly. Now, yeah. the other thing is, if I am truly in business for myself, I'm not in business to keep you in business. Right. I'm in business to keep me right. in business. Right. Why is that, like, not common and, knowledge? Yeah, people, for whatever reason, they don't understand that. It is... It's kind of a tricky thing, and honestly, when I went full-time in photography, I did not want to shoot weddings. I was mainly going into commercial and sports, mm -hmm. but I was prepared. I had gone on Craigslist, of all things, and looked under photographers under the gig section, right. and there was hundreds of listings where people were looking for wedding photographers for 300 bucks or 250 bucks. Right. And I told my wife, I said, if it comes down to it, I'm going to figure out a way that I can make money right. on doing a $300 wedding every weekend right. if that's what it takes me to keep from having to punch a clock. Right. And, and here's another thing, too. Here's another thing people don't think about, right? Every day, every single day that goes by where you didn't earn a check, it's a zero day. It's a zero. You got a zero that day. Is 300 better than zero? Is 500 better than zero? It's not a $3,000 wedding. Well, would you rather have had 300 or $500 and some and, and added some more experience, right? Getting more involved with your workflow, getting more familiar with your gear, oh, figuring out all those little stupid little obstacles that are, are, are going to be endemic to every single niche. There's There are all kinds of ob obstacles that I've had to learn to overcome, lighting, basically primarily lighting problems, but other stuff too, you know, sellers wanting to rush you out of the house. Now you can't do your whole workflow, but you got to make the photos look just as good to the agent, even though you, you now you got to do a whole house all ambient because they're rushing you out or they got crap all over the place. And you got to, you got to make sure you're to the next photo shoot on time, right? But you have to help these people pick their crap up. And now you don't have enough time to do your, your main workflow, but you still got to deliver the goods above the bar where the quality expectation is in your, your agent's mind. Who Usually the agent's not even there. They don't know about what you're doing here. You know, you're having to pick up all the crap of the seller. So now you've got to do an abbreviated workflow so that you can get to the next place on time. You know, you learn those things as you're in the field doing the things. And so not only do you lose on the $300 or the $500 that Saturday that you could have had, these are like, oh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not bringing the industry down. I am not working for those rates. You lose, you weren't going to get anything anyway. You didn't have a $3,000 wedding scheduled. So you lost the three or 500 bucks or whatever it was. You lost the experience that you would have gotten in your niche doing the work in that field. And you would have needed, you know, experience is that you could build into your mind for the next one, when you do have the three, five thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand dollars destination wedding, you lost all of that. It was literally a zero. You know what you did? You sat at home and you played Fortnite or you played uh, Splatoon or you went on Netflix or whatever. You had a zero day. You didn't move the ball forward even one yard. And you know, business, this business, photography business, if you ever want to be great, you got to make sure you're moving every single day that you possibly can. Unless you're sick or you're taking vacation day or date day with the wife or something like that, in which case you're moving the ball forward in a different area of your life. Every day that you're working or should be working, you need to move it at least forward one yard. Every day isn't going to be a big touchdown pass. But every day needs to be you knowing you did something to move the ball forward one yard. And if you're not doing that... You need to be shaming yourself inside and saying, I didn't do what I needed to do to move the ball forward at least a bit today. I'm ashamed of that. I'm going to correct that behavior tomorrow and make sure I do move the ball forward 
uh, one day, even if it's next week, it's just, I am going to take that 300 wedding. I'm going to take that 500 wedding. And so, you know, those kind of principles, I think, are all about right thinking about business. But do you want to swing back to this, uh, the pitch? I'm getting these? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. All well, right. I tell you what, real quick before you go yeah. there, <clears throat> I'm going to play devil's advocate for one question. On okay, this. go ahead. Something, 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 something